commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching, dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. The title of this talk is a very interesting title, and I'll get to that reason. It could have much more simply been called Talk on the Call of Christ, because Ignatius has a meditation in the spiritual exercises on the call of Christ. And his version of it has a very particular uh, personal bent to it. What he wants the retreatant to do in this meditation is go through what he went through when he was lying on his bed in Loyola, recovering from his self-inflicted wound of vanity. Remember, he had had part of his leg cut off because he wanted to be able to wear tights so that he could show off his very shapely legs, which is what men did at the time. And as a result of this, he was recovering in his room in Loyola in Spain. And during this time, he wanted um, to pass the time. And he started asking his sister, who was there, if she would bring him the kind of books that he used to like to read, which were mostly books about knights doing great things. Books about knights going to save ladies in distress, books about knights who would travel to foreign lands and, and fight against the infidels and wage crusades and do things like this. Um, his favorite knight was Amadeus of Gaul, and he loved to read stories about his sort of um, going off to as a knight errant in order to pursue these, these wonderful uh, adventures. So Ignatius was very romantic in this sense. But none of these books were to be found in the house. And so what his sister started bringing him instead is what she could find in the house, which were two books. One was A Life of Christ, and another was a collection of stories of the saints. And Ignatius found that as he would read these, he would go back and forth between imagining himself as Amadeus of Gaul or one of these other knights. Um, and then he would imagine himself as one of the saints. And as he says in his autobiography, he says, sometimes I would say, what if I were one of these great knights doing these other things? And then he would say, well, what if I was with, like St. Dominic? Or what if I was like St. Francis? What if I actually lived like they lived? What would it be like? What would my life be like? And he said, what I found is that when I would finish imagining myself as a knight, I would feel good for a few moments and then I would feel very dry and very listless and very restless. But when he would imagine himself doing what St. Francis or St. Dominic did, he would still feel, many hours later, he would still feel very energized by this thought. And he came to realize that what he really wanted to do was follow a life much more like that of St. Francis or St. Dominic. And this was the very beginning of his conversion. In this meditation called The Call of Christ, then what Ignatius is trying to do is get the retreatant to repeat for themselves, to live for themselves, go through for themselves something of what St. Ignatius experienced when he was on his bed of recovery. Now this seems, I think this might seem for us to be something that only, you know, only people would do at the very beginning of their uh, conversion or something like that, or at the beginning of their life. But I was reminded recently that my own grandpa ended up moving down to the Lord's Ranch to be a full-time missionary only after he had retired from a, a full life in Rhode Island of heading up his own construction company. That's when he felt his call to serve the Lord in this particular way. And recently I was visiting my aunt, Pat, who has um, recently retired from spending an entire life as a math teacher. And then she realized that she could finally follow what really was her, her dream of 
serving migrants along the border and working with them and helping with their documentation and helping them re reunite with their families in the United States. And so this call of Christ, this meditation on the call of Christ, it's never too late for us. It's never too late to start um, what I've heard some people call it, holy daydreaming, thinking, what would I really like to do to serve the Lord if I had a chance? What would I do? So the way Ignatius sets up this meditation is he says, first, in the first half of the meditation, imagine some earthly king or an earthly leader who you would follow to the ends of the earth. And he says, just imagine that for a while. Now being the nerd that I am, liking Lord of the Rings, that I would often imagine that I was following Aragorn or Gandalf or something, that no matter what they told me, I would probably go. I would be like Sam, following Frodo all the way to Mount Doom. Who would your leader be? Some people choose a politician. Some people choose a secular leader. I often think too, Pope John Paul II, Pope Francis, these are people, if they called me up right now and said, I need you to go do this, I would drop everything and go and do it. So Ignatius says, who would that leader be for you? Who is that person for you who wakes up your desires, who sets you on fire, who makes you want to be a great person, who you would follow at the drop of a hat, and then he says, well, if you would be willing to do that for some human person, why would you not be willing to do that for Christ? And I, I think this is actually a meditation we could do at any moment of our life, no matter how far along we are in our spiritual life or how early we are in our spiritual life. At every moment, we need to get better at dropping the hat and going, at dropping the hat and following Christ getting better at responding to the call of Christ. At the end of this meditation, Ignatius gives us a prayer, and I want to read this prayer for you. It's a very beautiful one, I think. It's something like a pledge. Having finished this meditation, here is the pledge that he thinks every good Christian would make, and it's called the prayer to the eternal Lord of all things. And this is how it goes. It says, Eternal Lord of all things, in the presence of your infinite goodness and of your mother and of all the saints, this is the offering of myself that I make with your favor and help. It is my desire. Notice that word desire again. We've seen it several times. It shows up in the first principle and foundation. It shows up all through the constitutions. Ignatius is all about taking our desires where they are and then reforming them reorienting them towards Christ. It is my desire and my deliberate choice, provided only that it is for your greater glory, to imitate you in bearing all sufferings. Notice, we never get away from sufferings. Bearing all sufferings, renouncing all attachments by choosing spiritual poverty. Notice again, the emphasis on spiritual poverty, on humility. Embracing actual poverty too, if that is your will, and fully responding to the vocation that you have for me, if it truly be for your greater glory, amen. So notice again, the emphasis at the end of this call of Christ. Ignatius thinks this is for everyone, not just people called to religious life or priesthood. He thinks everyone who wants to follow this king would be ready to make this commitment, would be ready to say, I am going to follow you in spiritual poverty, and actual poverty, if you call me to that. I am going to follow you in renouncing all attachments. I am going to follow you no matter where you lead me, if that is what you call me to. He thinks anyone, any soldier, he says, should be willing to make this offering. And so he means that for any one of us. He doesn't just mean this for those called to religious life. He means this for any one of us. All of us are called to follow the Lord with all of our lives. Notice, this is not a prosperity gospel. There's nothing uh, particularly easy about this calling. He doesn't promise us typical happiness. And actually, we gotta remember, the happiness he does promise us is the happiness of the Beatitudes. And that's not your normal happiness. That's a happiness of hunger, sorrow, very challenging and difficult things. But this is, the, uh, this is the kind of happiness he calls to. And it's also helpful to remember, as Pope Benedict reminds us in his book on Jesus of Nazareth, 
that when Jesus calls his disciples, this is in Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 13. When Jesus calls his disciples, he doesn't say, follow me and I'm going to give you a fulfilled life. We know he will. We know he'll give us the fulfillment that we need because we'll be following him. This is what he says, though. Notice he calls them to two things, not one thing. It says, Jesus went up on the mountain and he summoned those whom he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he may send them forth. Notice the two things. Jesus calls apostles to do two things. The first is to be with him. The first is to be with him. The second is to be sent forth. This is something I never noticed before Pope Benedict pointed this out. First, he calls us to this contemplative aspect, to be with him, just to be with him. This is the reward. What's the reward of this life? Being with Jesus. That's a reward. That's a great thing. That's all we ever want. That's all we were ever created for. And then being with him to be sent out as well. But the first thing that we're called to, and Ignatius says, you know, in this call of, of, of the meditation of Christ, Ignatius says, well, this calling is for anyone who would be willing to follow him to, he says explicitly, to wear the same clothing as Jesus wore, to eat with him, to sit around the campfire with him, to know that this is gonna be a life of hardship. But what more could be wanted than to be with him? So first of all, it's a call to be with Jesus. Each of you, in whatever life you live in, is called first and foremost to be with Jesus, to be with him. This is the life you're called to. Are you with him? Are you being with him? Now, there's a real challenging aspect to this call. And you've all heard of this idea of dying to self. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take up, I think, a particularly poignant description of what it means to follow Christ that Paul gives to us. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles there, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. Paul says, we always carry about in the body the dying of Jesus, in Greek, the necrosis of Jesus, his dying, his going to the cross his entire life. We always carry that about within ourselves so that the life of Jesus may always be ma also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are constantly being given up to death for the sake of Jesus. This given up, the Greek word is paradidomai. It's a very theological word. It, it's used all throughout the Gospels for the handing over of Jesus to his death. We are all always being handed over to our death. Very interesting. When, to follow Christ means to live this paradidomatic life. That's a made up word. I just made it up. It's not, a, uh, it's not paradigmatic, right? It's a paradidomatic life, a life of being handed over. To be with Christ is to be handed over to death, to this life of dying to the self so that we can experience the transformed life that he has in mind for us. Remember, we're all made for resurrected life. We're all made for that resurrected body that Jesus had after the resurrection. But to get there, we have to go through the, the progressive necrotic experience of dying to ourselves, of going to the cross with Christ, and then of experiencing the resurrection. So Paul says, death is at work in us, but life in you. As apostles, as those called to be with Jesus, death is at work in us. A very challenging idea, death is at work in us. The death though, not of sin. Remember, there's the death of sin that can be in work in us, and then there's the dying with Christ that can be at work in us. And it's the second one. Once we've been baptized, once we've entered the, life, the sacramental life of the church, this dying to sin is no longer at work in us. We've put that aside. We've put those attachments aside. We've gotten to the, depth, the, the depths of those roots of sin, and we've dealt with those, and we've let the grace of Christ get to the bottom of those. 
There is another kind of death at work in us, though, now, and this is the dying with Christ, the allowing of ourselves every day fully to live and to suffer and to die with Christ. And this is the life of self-mortification. And this is a very challenging kind of life. And I want to speak of it in two ways. How do we live this, very practically speaking, right? How do we live this, this life of progressive necrosis? How do we live this paradigmatic life, this life of handing ourselves over like Jesus handed himself over? Every single Christian, I think, is called to two things in this area. The first is to a life of daily self-mortification. Very practically, very concretely, when do you fast? What do you eat? Do you eat healthfully? Do you eat in a way that sustains you for the work that God gives you to do? Do you eat a lot of sugar? How do we justify that? We know it's bad for us, how do we justify it? Do we drink a lot of soda? How do we justify that? These are very easy ways to live self-mortifying ways, self-mortifying lives. What kind of clothes do we wear? Is it to make us feel good about ourselves in the wrong kind of way? Is it to promote a certain facade about ourselves, a certain appearance about ourselves that's not true? This is part of our self-mortification. What kind of time do you spend on your phone? Who is the first face I see every morning? Is it the face of the Lord and of your husband and wife? Or is it Facebook, your phone, the first thing you look at when you get up in the morning? What's the last thing you see before you go to bed at night? Is it, is it your wife, your children, the face of the Lord? Is it prayer? Or is it being on your phone? These are little forms of self-mortification. Each and every Christian is called to this life of self-mortification. That's the first concrete aspect of following the Lord that we're all called to. The second one is a life of frugal solidarity. And this can be much more challenging, especially all of us who live in a much more affluent society compared to most of the world. It's also very easy for us, and I hear this a lot, to say, well, the frugal solidarity of following Christ, the, the poverty that Ignatius really desired for each and every one of us, is really just detachment. And detachment is an important part of the poverty that we're called to live. But detachment is the result of this frugal solidarity. It's not the core of it. The core of it is actually living simple lives actually living lives of dying to ourselves so that others can have and benefit from the goods that I am concretely giving up. This is a much more concrete thing than just detachment because detachment can easily float off into the clouds and means that I don't actually change my lifestyle at all. Pope Francis has been calling us to this very seriously, uh, particularly in his first apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. Listen to these words. This is from paragraph 201. No one must say that they cannot be close to the poor because their own lifestyle demands more attention to other areas. The gospel meaning of the poor and of poverty are required for everyone. This struck me very hard when I first read it. No one can say, well, you know, the Lord's really calling me in another area of my life. I'm really not supposed to have much contact with the poor. That's why I've always loved this story of Father Thomas taking his students to, to see how the horses lived and then to see how the poor lived. We are all called to have regular contact with the poor, those who are Christ's favorites, and to allow that then to impact our lives and our actual concrete lifestyle. I'm a Jesuit and I've heard all the jokes. People tell the jokes about all the time. They see the way that Jesuits live sometimes and they say, well, if this is poverty, bring on chastity. Maybe you've heard that joke. I'm aware that it's a great challenge for us as well. It's, I think it's a challenge for every Christian. Christ did not mince words on this. He calls us to live with him, to walk with him, and to follow his own lifestyle. And he was a man of simplicity. He lived a simple life. He lived a life of frugality. He lived a life of self-mortification. 
And so we are called all. As someone who's uh, used media a lot in evangelization, so I believe in the importance of Catholic radio, Catholic TV, Catholics using the new media. Can I encourage everyone to watch your home TV? I think it's a great vehicle of evangelization. And God bless all of you. Shalom World, God's own channel.